Yes, thank you very much. We defined two types of distributions, the beta distribution and the beta prime distribution in the d-dimensional setting. And in this lecture, I would like to talk about the properties of these distributions, which make it possible to compute various expected numbers related to beta and beta prime polytops. Recall that the beta density is the following probability density. It is defined on the d-dimensional ball. Beta is the parameter and the value of the density at x is a constant which plays no role in the following times one minus the norm of x squared to the power beta. This is defined for x in the unit ball, in the unit ball of the d-dimensional space. And beta is a parameter which is greater than minus one and the value of of minus one, it can be interpreted as uniform distribution of the sphere as we argued yesterday. Now the beta prime density is defined similarly. And this is why I will concentrate on the beta density because they have similar properties. And it is C times one plus X squared to the power minus beta, this time for all X in the d-dimensional space and the parameter beta satisfies b greater than d over half. And now I want to state some properties of these distributions. The first property is the invariance under projections. Under projections. It states that if we take a beta distribution on the ball, I, I will state it just for the beta case, the beta prime case is similar, and project it onto a subspace passing through the origin, some linear subspace. Then the result of the projection is again a beta distribution, but with different parameters. More precisely, let us consider a projection, which I call pi, capital pi, from Rd to Rd minus L. So the dimension is decreased by L under this projection. And you imagine you can imagine Rd minus L as just the subspace of Rd spent by the first D minus L coordinates, for example. And the projection just removes the last L coordinates or, or sets them to be zero. And now there are two, two claims. Uh, the first case claim is if x is a random vector which has beta distributions with parameter d and beta, then pi x is again beta distributed on the d minus l dimensional space and with a parameter beta which increases by l half. So each each dimension each uh, we, we lose here under projection increases the parameter by one half. And similarly for the beta prime case, if x is f d, the projection of x is again a beta prime distribution on the d minus l dimensional space with parameter which is beta minus l half. Now the proof is just by integration. So we consider only the beta case and Without loss of generality, we assume that L is equal to one because otherwise we can just repeat this projection. We can project first, remove first one coordinate, then another one, another one, and so on. And each time we get here one half. So if, if we prove it just for L equals one, it's enough. And the now we can just compute the density of the projected variable at some point y from the unit pole in the d minus one dimensional sp space. And let the distance to the origin be equal to r. Well, then the density at this point y, so we, we have here on this picture, we have here somewhere y is the origin, this distance is r, and we can compute the density Our projection is 
loses one dimension, so it removes one dimension, which means we integrate over an interval, and the boundaries of the interval are minus s square and plus one minus square root of r squared. And the function which we integrate is just the beta density at the point which 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 is the this height. So let us call it s. So we integrate over s, and the function which we integrate is this distance, or one, or more precisely one minus this distance squared to the power beta. But this distance is uh, this distance is is square root from. Okay, so maybe it's not a nice notation. Here is s. Here is r. Uh, yeah, e exactly. And this distance here is square root of s squared plus r squared. So what we integrate is just the function one minus r squared minus s squared to the power beta ds. And now this integral can be performed by the substitution s is equal to one minus r squared t. T is the new variable, which ranges between minus one and plus one. And the function which we have here is one minus r squared minus one minus r squared t squared to the power of beta, and then one minus r squared dt. And now let us count how many terms of the form one minus r squared we have here. We have beta of them, and then one half. So we have here we have it to the power beta and here, here we have it to the power one half. And then we have the integral minus one, one of C, one minus T squared to the power beta, dt. But this is just some constant. It plays no role, it's a constant. And now we computed the density of pi x at some point y at distance r, and the density is proportional to one minus r squared to this power. And now the constant here must be such that the integral of the whole density is one. So it's, it is the beta density with parameter beta plus one half. So here we see that this parameter appeared. Now, I think this proves the, the statement. Now let us look at the special case when beta is equal to minus one or more, more precisely when beta goes to minus. In this case, x is the uniform distribution on the sphere. It is uniformly distributed on the unit sphere in the d-dimensional space. Is a projection from rd to rd minus one. So we lose here two dimensions. Then the claim states that pi x is going to be beta distributed with parameters d minus two and well it was minus one at the beginning and then we add here plus two divided by two so it is zero zero which means that pi x is uniformly distributed on the ball in the d minus two dimensional space so if we project the uniform distribution on the sphere such that two dimensions are lost, then we get a uniform distribution on the ball. And now let us look at the paintings here. They show something interesting. Here you see a painting which is called Cicero discovering the tomb of Archimedes. Uh, now, Cicero described in one of his texts that he discovered the tomb of Archimedes and the special feature of this tomb, which allowed him to find it, was the presence of a bowl and a cylinder here. And this is another painting of the same, showing the same event, where you see again a bowl and a cylinder. And this is because, but there are also some paintings where there is no bowl and no cylinder, unfortunately. Now, the reason for the presence of the ball and the cylinder is that Archimedes considered as his main achievement, the formula for the volume or maybe for the surface of the ball, 
which he related to the surface of the cylinder. And a special case of the above claim is exactly what Archimedes proved. Namely, if we take a sphere in the three-dimensional space, so this is a two-dimensional sphere, and project it on the interval, so in this way. Then the uniform distribution on the sphere is projected to the uniform distribution on the interval, which means that if we take, for example, two slices of the sphere, if we take two slices, then the surface area of the sphere between these two slices is does not depend on the position of the slices. It depends just on the distance between them. So if we know the distance b equals b minus a, then the, the surface area of, of this part of the sphere is proportional to b minus a, which is a little bit surprising because one could expect that here, if, if, we, if we shift it, say, from the middle to, to, to the top of the sphere, it, it should become smaller, but it, it does not. And this is the fact which Archimedes proved. So he proved that projection from a sphere to the cylinder, if, if we have here an outscribed cylinder, then the surface area of the sphere is equal to the surface area of the cylinder, ignoring the top and the bottom parts of the cylinder. So th that was his, his theorem. And it is true in, in any dimension, actually, if we for, for any projection which under which we lose to dimension two. Now, um, let us state the next property of the beta distribution. It is actually very simple to verify if it is the norm of the beta distribution vector. If we take a vector dimension D, then its norm, or more, more, more precisely its squared norm, has the usual beta distribution. It is what we know from probability theory. Yeah, from, from the usual probability theory as beta distribution, the one dimensional one. And the density of, just to remind you, the density of a beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta of the classical one is uh, t to the power alpha times one minus t to the power uh, alpha minus one times one minus t to the power beta minus one on the interval zero one times constant of course and it's easy to verify using polar integration and now the third property which is due to miles is the possibility to compute Namely, let us consider just for concreteness, not to introduce a complicated notation, let us consider three vectors, x1, x2, x3, which have beta distribution in Rd. And let us consider the following set S. It consists of all sums of the form lambda i x i, in this case three, such that lambda i are between zero and one. Now this is the parallelepiped spanned by the three points. And it has some volume, which is essentially the square root of the sum determinant. But we can compute here, and this is result by miles. Uh, we can compute the volume of this parallelepiped exactly or more precisely, we can compute the distribution exactly. Namely, the result is as follows. The volume squared has the same distribution as a product of beta random variables, which I will write down right now. Let us derive this formula and write it down. So the derivation is by induction. It's induction over the number of points generating over the number of points, so over three. If we have one point, then everything is clear. Then the volume is just the squared length of this interval, of the interval joining zero and x1. And 
it is beta distributed with these parameters. So we can write immediately here as a first factor d half beta plus one. Now let us consider two points, x1 and x2. So we have x1, we have x2, and here is s. We can do the following. We can condition on x1. And if we conditioned on x1, then this line is fixed. And we have just one random vector x2. So here, uh, here we have x1, which is fixed, and here we have x2, which is random, but the volume of this is the same as the volume of, of that rectangle. So we need to project x2, the vector x2, to the orthogonal complement of x1. So project x2 to the orthogonal complement of x1, and we are interested in the length. We have to multiply the length of x1 by this projection. Now, the space which is spun by x1, the line spun by x1, here, here we have the origin, is fixed. So the, we can just apply our previous results here. We can apply, we, we can state that the um, projection is beta distributed on, the, on this orthogonal complement. So projection is, is beta, uh, beta distributed on the orthogonal complement. And the parameters are, well, the dimension decreases by one and beta decreases by one half, which means that the parameters are here, we have d minus one half, d plus one, three half, uh, b, b plus three half, beta plus three half. It's just the squared length of the projection. So this second, second term here is the squared length of the projection. And one has to be, of course, one has to be careful. The important thing here is that these considerations do not really depend on the length of x1, on, 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 on the event on which we condition. It's completely irrelevant what the length of x1 is, this result is always the same, which means that we have here independence and that's why we can write it in this way. So both terms here are independent random variables. And what comes next is also independent. And it's easy to see what is next. So if we have x1, x2, x3, x1, x2, x3, then we condition on x on x1 and x2, or on the subspace, maybe on x1 and x2. They span a two-dimensional plane, and we have to project x3 on the orthogonal complement of this plane. So let us call the plane linear x1, x2, and we project x3 on this orthogonal complement. And again, by these rules, we know that the projection is beta distributed, its length is classically beta distributed, so, or squared length is classically beta distributed, so we have here beta with, with some parameters. More precisely, we lose one more dimension here, and here we have beta plus four half, and so on. So this can be done, of course, for any number of vectors up to d. And a small remark, Something like this is also possible for synthesis, but it's more complicated. So one can replace relotops by simplices generated by these points and compute the complete distribution of the volume in some sense. Now let us proceed to the next property of the beta distribution. And this may be the most important one. It's not the easiest one, but it is essential when we try, are trying to do something with beta polytops. The fourth property is called the canonical decomposition.
and again it's people Ruben and Miles. It states the following. Let us take a random variables with beta distribution. So x1, xk are d beta distributed on the d-dimensional space and are iid. k is smaller than d. k is smaller than or equal. And let us consider the affine subspace generated by these points. So for example, if we have if this is the unit ball, everything is, the, in, is in the unit ball for the beta distribution. And we may have here two points, x1, x2. Then A is the line joining these two points. And let us denote by P of A the projection. Of the origin to this affine subspace to A. And let us denote by h of a the distance. So it is the distance from the origin to a. And now there is a way to describe the distribution of a and moreover to describe the distribution of x1 and x2 inside a. So in some sense, the idea of this canonical decomposition is to do the following. Suppose we fix A, so we condition everything on A. Here is the, the subspace A. Suppose we condition on it. Then inside A or inside this slice of the ball, X1 and X2 have some conditional distribution. And it is a distribution, well, on, on this slice, which is a ball of dimension, in this case, D minus one. Uh, no, in this case, in the, of dimension one. If, if we have two points. So it is a distribution on the ball, but this ball is not standard. So we have to standardize it. And the claim is that after we have standardized it, the distribution of X1 and X2 conditionally on A does not depend on anything. It doesn't depend on A. So if we have here another A at a different distance to the origin, and again, we the same after we have normalized everything to the unit ball. And this is done as follows. Let us, first of all, we have a problem that x1 and x2 are contained in A. And everything depends, or it's A, 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 A if, if we condition on A, and if we condition on some other A, then of course we have different distributions here. So we have to bring everything to some standard Euclidean space. Namely, let us do the following for every, affine subspace A with dimension equal to K minus one, which is the case in our setting. Let us fix some mapping I A, which identifies A with the, with the Euclidean space. It should be an iso isometry and we require that i a of p of a is zero. So we fix some isometry of this space with r k minus one, and we require that this point, this one pi of p of a is mapped to zero. And now we have standardized everything and we can do the following, we can consider the points zi defined as follows. We take, so we map these points to some standard Euclidean space, but then they are in the ball in this space of radius, which is one minus, uh, which is the square root of one minus h squared. So this is that, that radius. And that's why we divide by it. We divide it h squared of a, and then these points belong to the unit ball in the k minus one dimensional space. And the claim is now that if we condition on a in some sense, then the distribution of these points z1, zk does not depend on a. It's one of the claims. There are in fact many. So here are 
the planes. The first one is that Z1, Zk, this random vector or a, a, a cuple of random vectors is independent, stochastically independent of A, which is a little bit surprising. So if, if we condition on A, then for every A, the result, this distribution is the same. And the second claim describes this distribution. So it states that Z1, Zk, this tuple of vectors has the following density, the following joint density. The density is also a little bit surprising. So what could be the naive guess for this density? We could think something like this. Suppose we fix A, condition on A. Then our points x1, x2, and so on, well, they before conditioning, they had a density which was just a product of beta distributions. So it was fd beta of x1 and so on, times and so on. And now we condition on A. Condition means we just restrict everything to A. So the densities would be just the same densities restricted to A. And now it's easy to check that for the beta density, the shape of the density under such a restriction and after such a transformation to the unit ball stays essentially the same. So if I take the beta density restrict to this line and then map the line again or restrict it to, to such a ball like here and then map this ball to the unit one, then I get the, the same beta density. It's one of the properties. So what could be the naive guess here for the joint density of Z1, Zk is that it is just a product of beta densities, the same one, but on the, on the lower dimensional space. So it, it, could, it should be constant times or even without constant, the product i equals one to k f k minus one because, because we are in the k dimensional space with parameter beta, the same one of, well, of these variables, the i, that, that would be the naive guess, just if we just restrict the densities to this subspace. Namely, this is not true, what, what this naive guess is not true. And the reason is the blaschke petkanshin formula, which is used in the proof. Which leads to one more factor here. It is delta to the power d minus k plus one of z1 zk. And delta of z1 zk is the volume of the simplex formed by z1 zk. Of the convex hull of z1 zk. I mean the k minus one dimensional volume. Now, what is the reason for this? Uh, of course, it's not, not easy to explain why this is so, but just a very, very um, rough explanation. Suppose we take points like here, take IAD points in the d-dimensional space, and we they span some affine subspace like here, and then we condition on this affine subspace. Conditioning on a zero event is something which is not straightforward. In fact, we cannot condition on the event the affine subspace is exactly A. We have to condition on the event that this affine subspace is the limit. So that the, this affine subspace is in some neighborhood, in some small ball in the A. And then we have to take the radius of the ball to zero. But now, if we want that x1 and x2 generate a subspace which is close to A, then the points which, and, and, and we have some instance of x1 and x2 which generate A. So suppose we have these points, they generate A. And now I want to shift these points a little bit so that they still generate something from the neighborhood of A. And now we see that if the 
distance between these points is small, then small shifts will lead to small shifts of the point will lead to a big shift of A, which is why the which is why points having smaller distance are have lower density here. So if, if the distance is small, this density decreases. This is very roughly an explanation why some term of, of this form has to appear here. But uh, it's not easy to give a proof of this theorem in, on, in, in, in five minutes. <laughs> and so, okay, these are two claims. So we describe the joint distribution of these normalized points. And this distribution is independent of A. And one can also describe the distribution of A. So in, in some sense, we shall describe the complete distribution of this sample by first describing the distribution of A, which is random, and then describing the distribution of the points inside A. And the distribution of A is as follows. Well, um, one can just say that um, that phi of A, this point, it, it belongs to the subspace A orthogonal complement. And inside this subspace, it is beta distributed. So it is beta distributed with some parameters which we don't need here. So this gives the complete description of the of the distribution of the points x1, xk by first describing the distribution of A and then describing the distribution of the points inside A. And now I want to try to describe a property of beta polytops, which follows from this canonical decomposition and which makes it possible to compute their f vectors. So I want to describe the tangent cones very briefly, because I don't think we have enough time for this, of beta polytops. Um, first of all, let P be an arbitrary polytop, maybe a deterministic one. And let us consider some phase F. F is a phase of P. Then we can define oh, the tangent cone of P at F is defined as follows. It is T of P at F and it is the positive hull of the set P minus X bar, where X bar is any point in the interior of F, but not on the boundary of F. So if F is some face, then we take a point which is inside F, not on the boundary and it is called X bar in any point. The definition doesn't depend on the, cho on the choice of the point. And uh, well, picture if the face is a vertex which is the simplest special case of a vertex uh, of a face so suppose f is just a vertex then we have to take x bar to be the same the very same vertex and what we do here we take the positive hull of the all points from the polytop minus x so we take the positive hull of all these vectors and the result is this cone. So the result is this cone, of course, shifted to the origin, this angle. And it is called the tangent cone of P at F. Another special case in two dimensions, if we have a face F, which is now some side, one dimensional side of the polytop, then we have to take here any point. So here is the phase F, here is the point X bar, and then we have to take the convex hull, the positive hull of all vectors of this form, and of course of these vectors too, and the result is the result is a half space. This is a tangent cone, and now in higher dimensions one can also imagine something like this. Another definition of the tangent cone is the following one. It is 
the set of all directions. So if, if we are at X bar at some point inside this phase, then we can try to look in all possible directions and those directions which show inside the polytope belong to the tangent cone by definition. So it is the set of all directions V in RV such that there exists an epsilon sufficiently small with the property that X bar plus epsilon V is in P. It's the set of all the directions looking inside, inside the polytope. And now let us describe a property of the beta polytope. In some sense, it's the independence of the tangent cones from the faces. So very roughly speaking, it says that tangent cones of the polytope are independent of the shape of the faces. So let E one Xn be a beta polytope, which just means that Xi are d dimensional beta distributed in IID. And P is the convex hull of these points. Let us look at the faces of this polytope. And just for simplicity, consider the two-dimensional case, consider some potential at the one-dimensional case, consider some potential one-dimensional phase of the form convex hull of x1, x2. It's just a segment joining x1 and x2. And it generates some affine space. A. So it may be a face or not, of course, but it generates some line. It's the line passing through x1 and x2. And now let me draw a picture here. Uh, we will understand the meaning of this plane in the moment, but our face is here. So here is x1. Here is the point P of A. Here is the point x2. And here we have the origin, and this plane is the orthogonal complement of A, of the affine of the line passing through x1 and x2. Here is A, and what we have here is A orthogonal. It passes through the origin. This angle is, of course, the right angle. And now let us look at these two points and at, the all, at all remaining points. We have here many points, x3, x4, x5, and so on. And we want to consider the tangent cone or at this phase, if it is a phase. Now, how does this tangent cone look like? We have to take some point inside x1, x2. Let me just imagine it is this one. It, it, it needn't be between, of course, but let me just imagine for simplicity. It is this one. And then we can, we have to span to take the positive hull of all the vectors of the following form. This one, this one, starting from that point. This one, this one, and so on. And the result is a direct sum. It's easy to see that the result is a direct sum of A, or more precisely of A shifted to the origin, and of the cone which is located inside a orthogonal complement and which is spent by the projections of these points. So what we need to do is to project all these points to this plane and then to span a cone here by these projections. The result is some cone here, some angle, in this case, a two-dimensional cone in the plane. And the tangent cone is a, is a direct orthogonal sum of this angle and this line. So we can call the projections. We can call the projections, say, y5, y4, uh, y3, y4, and so on. This is called y. And then the tangent cone is nothing but the positive hull of y3 minus y and so on, y n minus y orthogonal sum with a one dimensional subspace. In this case, it is one dimension. So it is this a shift to the origin. 
And now, uh, what can we say about the shape of this tangent cone and the shape of this face? Well, the canonical decomposition states that if we take this face and we normalize it as usual, so we take not the face itself, but we standardize it so that it, it is in the unit pole. So let's say we, we intersect this A with the unit pole, shift it to the origin, and then make it again a unit pole. Uh, then this is the shape of the, of the face. And the shape of the face is independent of A. And of course, x1 and x2 are independent of this x3, x4, and so on. And this means after some work, one can show that the shape of this face after normalization is stochastically independent from the shape of this angle. So in some sense, the tangent cones are independent of the faces after normalization. And this property allows to compute the phase numbers of beta polytops. Well, in the next lecture, I will, at least at the very beginning, I will try to show why this is so. So I will try to explain why this independence is crucial for computing the phase numbers of beta polytops. At the beginning and the second, uh, the second part of the next lecture is a little bit unclear. Maybe I will try to explain how to compute the quantities, such as angles and external angles, which appear in the formulas for the expected f vectors of the beta polytops. I think at this point we can stop. Thank you, Herr.